Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and this is a lecture I gave at the 2017 Interventional Orthopedics Foundation uh, Conference in Denver, Colorado in February 2017, uh, and I'd like to give it to you today. Uh, the knee microenvironment, stem cells, and neural networks, the next frontier, and regen med outcomes. So our Colorado practice is very different. We have a university style lab within a medical practice. So we do a lot of primary lab based research, which is unusual. We also do a lot of clinical research because we have a, a large clinical research team. So our process is a bit different. We innovate in the lab, we perform clinical research, we track patients in a registry, we use data to guide treatment decisions, and ultimately we try to publish. Now, one of the big problems that's out there right now in stem cells is we have a lot of great animal models that seem to show that stem cells do uh, crazy great things, regrow cartilage, regrow discs, etc. But when we get into patients, a lot of times those results don't translate. And that's primarily because there's a big difference between what we're seeing with these genetically identical animals and the injuries we artificially create versus the real deal in patients. So this is likely why animal model results in stem cells haven't translated well into humans. Now, one of the ways to possibly fix this would be trying to control for the soil, because we may have a difference in the soil, so to speak, between the two, uh, an animal and a human, meaning that uh, in a human, we might have vastly different issues going on inside the knee with inflammation uh, related to inactivity, related to bad diet, related to genetics, versus an animal where we have pretty much all the same local environment. So if we understand better what's happening inside the knee and the synovial fluid, which would be the soil for our stem cells that we're injecting, could this help improve stem cell procedures? And what does the osteoarthritic, osteoarthritic knee microenvironment even look like? And how may this help impact our stem cell treatment? So is it possible that we could dial it in so that more patients would respond better to these treatments? So if we look at what the knee microenvironment, meaning what's inside the soil, what that looks like, we have two things going on. We have repair and maintenance on one side, we have breakdown on the other. For repair and maintenance, uh, we need healthy, healthy cartilage cells. We need uh, a controlled remodeling of matrix. That means that things are getting broken down and then rebuilt. We need normal loads and stability. We need a, a normal bone cartilage interface and a healthy joint mix. On the breakdown side, we can see inflammation that leads to bad cartilage cells. We can see uncontrolled breakdown of the matrix where the knee is literally eating itself alive. We can see too much uh, load or instability in the joint, which is breaking things down. We can also see an abnormal bone cartilage interface and a bad joint cell mix. So if we break that down even further, we can break it down into these four domains. Uh, we have degradation and repair, meaning breakdown and repair. So on the breakdown side, on the left here, we see what we call catabolism, and that's like demolition, uh, meaning we have chemicals that will break cartilage down. Now, a little bit of breakdown is fine. It's, it's actually needed to help repair, but when it gets out of control, that's a problem. On the degradation side, we also have too much inflammation occurring. Again, inflammation is needed for repair, but when it gets out of control, that leads to bad cartilage cells. On the repair side, we have anabolism, which is growth factors that will help build new things. Uh, we also have the opposite of that, which is anti-breakdown, or what we would call anti-catabolic. So that means that we have chemicals within the knee that will prevent things from breaking down. So when we're talking about demolition within the knee, 
Demolition is obviously a key part of building, right? So if you're going to remodel your kitchen, you first got to have the demo guys come in and take out all the stuff. And then they've got to come back in and put the new stuff in. And the same thing happens in the knee. If you're going to repair a cartilage, you're going to have to break it down first, and then you're going to have to repair it. But the problem is sometimes you get chronic catabolism or chronic excessive amounts of demolition. And that's like termites eating away at the walls of your house. And that's not good for the joint. And we know that osteoarthritis has this uncontrolled breakdown which happens through uh, proteinases uh, and peptidases. So these are things that will break down uh, parts of the cartilage. And we know that we have some specific breakdown chemicals. We have what are called MMPs uh, or matrix metalloproteinases. And there are bunches of different types of MMPs that exist in the knee. And we have uh, ADAM or ADAM metallopeptidases, and again, these are these break these guys are the bad guys that break things down. And what's interesting is that when there's a lot of inflammation, like with IL-1 and TNF alpha, those enhance the activity of MMPs. Um, and we know that we have chemicals that can actually stop some of this breakdown, what we call anti-catabolic. So that would be things like uh, uh, IRA um, or IL-1 receptor antagonist protein or IRAP, A2M, uh, TIMP, they can all counteract breakdown. One of the problems that we see is when there's a lot of inflammation, we can get bad cartilage. But when we add growth factors, um, the anabolic guy down there with the chains, uh, things like um, TGF, beta, FGF, IGF, insulin, those can help to repair. To delve a bit deeper into cartilage cell health, uh, we need to understand that if we've got chronic inflammation in a joint, that can lead to bad cartilage cells. If we have just acute inflammation, that's all part of the healing process. So we need to separate out kind of this acute inflammation from the chronic stuff. So the next question becomes, if we can understand what this soil is, can we intervene? Can we be like the farmer who's able to measure what's in the soil, see what's needed, and supplement that to get the best seeds to grow? So how would we foil the bad guys? How would we uh, try to stop the guys that are breaking things down? And this is anti-catabolism or anti-catabolic. Well, TGF-beta, which is a growth factor found in PRP, can do that. TIMP1 and TIMP2, uh, which are naturally occurring anti-catabolic uh, cytokines, can do that. Alpha-2 macroglobulin can do that. And IRAP can do that. We know that PRP can stop breakdown because it's anabolic. And these are some of the studies that show that. We also know that a chemical called A2M, alpha-2 macroglobulin, also can stop breakdown. And based on a recent study, uh, it takes about 150 micrograms per ml of A2M to do that. And here's a here's a nice image of how A2M works. Um, and it's pretty to what the molecule looks like. So this is what the molecule looks like here. And these are the breakdown bad guys, these proteinases. So literally the molecule binds these proteinases and uh, takes them out of out of action, so to speak. Uh, and we we see here what that, that finally looks like. So it gives you a nice visual of how A2M works. Now the big question is, uh, do common orthobiologics have A2M? So we can see here that just uh, serum and platelet-poor plasma and the serum found in bone marrow aspirate 
all have enough A2M, which is this minimal amount. So these are the amounts present in various patients that we tested. So pretty much everybody that we tested uh, got over this line right here. Uh, so it means that everyone we tested had enough A2M to inhibit breakdown if that stuff obviously is injected into a knee. So can we use these concepts to improve the effects of bone marrow concentrate or a same day stem cell treatment? Again, as I said before, to date, we've been like pre-industrial farmers. We, for instance, we know that manure helps uh, the seeds. So we throw in some PRP. PRP is like our manure for our seeds. We know it kind of helps stem cells. So we throw it in with some stem cells and that's all we know. But we don't have any idea of whether the soil needs to be supplemented in specific ways. So from a 30,000 foot view, can we track cytokine and growth factor levels uh, with a same day stem cell treatment? Can we understand what's happening with all these levels or is it gonna be beyond our understanding because it's too complex? So this is a research study that we've been working on for quite some time now. And uh, we use a three part uh, stem cell procedure where we do a pre-injection, and then we do the stem cell procedure a couple days later, and then a post-injection a couple days after that. So at this point at the pre-injection, we're withdrawing a quarter cc of uh, synovial fluid under ultrasound. And at this point in the post-injection, we take the same amount. And we use this fancy machine down here, a multiplex microarray ELISA, to measure 25 cytokines and growth factors in that synovial fluid. And this is kind of a nightmare. Uh, we're looking here at microenvironment uh, and we see all of these different levels. So these are all the different chemicals we're measuring down here. This is just on a few patients going this way. And you can see the levels are kind of all over the place. If we graph that out a different way, we can look at some of this. Here, we've got this growth factor that all went up before and after the procedure. This one didn't change. This one, some of them went up, some of them went down. This one, most of them went up, but uh, one of them went down. This one, they didn't change, no change. All of them went up, some of them went down, some of them stayed the same. Uh, it's kind of all over the, the map. So what do we do with this chaotic data? Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, you may or may not realize is that right now, everything you do is being tracked through what's called big data. And the problem with big data is it's all over the map as well. So software engineers have developed lots of different ways to analyze this data to make sense of it. And one of those ways is called a neural network. Now, this might sound like science fiction. Um, you might be saying, what? What's a neural network? Why would you want to use that in, in science? Well, everything in your world, from the dictation on your phone, to the way UPS delivers packages, to the machines that are about to drive your car, will be run by a neural network. It's a type of software that's very good at learning. It's basically also called machine learning. So, Basically, the machine learns from the patterns in the data rather than having to be hard programmed. So neural networks are becoming increasingly common in healthcare. We see uh, IBM's Watson, for instance, being used uh, in cancer care where it's helping doctors pick the best chemotherapy agents. And it's doing that because it knows what the patterns show much more than the doctors could ever pull out because one doctor only has his own experience and sometimes he has biases and that's flawed. But if you look at the, look at the experience of thousands of doctors, you can pick out the trends from this very chaotic data that might not even be available to be seen using traditional statistical analysis. So this is our use of a neural network. And, and this is actually um, really uh, what it looks like with all the different chemicals we're measuring here. 
and all the different connections between the neurons, meaning these artificial nerve cells that are set up within the program, and then the output over here. So we have 31 different variables, which, which are proteins plus other things, uh, whether the knee is swollen or non-swollen, um, simple demographics like age, gender, uh, how heavy, the, <coughs> excuse me, how heavy the patient is. And then we have uh, pre-op and post-op scores for outcome here. And what this graph shows is once we look at only 60 patients, we start to see some things. So one of the things is that these growth factors seem to be more important in determining outcome. And these growth factors down here and factors seem to be less uh, important in determining outcome. Again, here, these growth factors seem to be a little bit more important in determining outcome these growth factors seem to be less important. And right now with just 63 patients, the model is good enough to attain 84% accuracy in picking out the best patients just based on the synovial fluid sample itself. So uh, hopefully we're gonna complete uh, really here in the next week, we will have collected samples on 200 patients and within the next six months we'll have enough data on those patients to, to run a much bigger model and there's lots of different types of pre-processing we're working on to hopefully get that model into the low 90s so the concept would be a model that uses neural networks that's 90 some percent accurate in, in figuring out which patients are going to respond and which patients are probably going to fail this kind of treatment solely based on the content of the stuff uh, and the chemicals that are in their knee synovial fluid. So can we use this technology to go further? How about to predict which regen med procedures themselves might work better in which patients? Now luckily we've already created the world's largest and most prolific registry data in orthopedic regenerative medicine. Um, uh, I don't know of anything that's even close when it comes to true regenerative medicine and the use of stem cells in, in knee arthritis, for example, or all the different types of things we're measuring. So this is our existing infrastructure, um, how we collect all of this data about patients. And we'll be adding some key pieces, some additional data input here. Um, we will add the neural network analysis on the registry data and we'll do have to do some things here to be able to again add some additional data but hopefully we can start to use all of this in an attempt to help predict which treatments might be best for which patients so in summary can we use these cytokine growth factor levels to predict outcome can we control the microenvironment to improve cartilage repair and outcome and treatments like knee arthritis? Are some patients uh, based on these metrics just very poor candidates and we should never offer them this type of same day stem cell treatment? And can neural networks help patients make the best regen med decisions? And we hope to continue to answer these very important questions as time goes on. Uh, so some exciting stuff that we've been working on now for the last two years that we're going to blow up and do much more of and really aligning ourselves with the way the world is going. Uh, the way the world is going is, is the use of artificial intelligence in helping uh, physicians, helping attorneys, helping UPS drivers make decisions about health care. And we want to do the same thing with our patients. So thanks so much for watching uh, and have a great day. And I hope this was uh, enlightening. Thank you.